in this closing session of Gospel of the Kingdom, I made Glenda Sue jump. Praise God. Um, but a couple of you have brought some items to my attention that I wanted to, to deal with before getting into the meat of the matter on repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. One, uh, two of you mentioned to me, uh, don't forget to talk about the prophecy of Enoch. So I will. And here it is in the book of Jude. It'll come up here on the screen in just a moment. This is quoted from the book of Enoch. And um, I'm a real fan of apocryphal books. Believe me, I understand the difference between apocryphal books and the Bible, so don't lecture me, okay? I say that to people that, you know, think I need to be criticized. And I don't mind constructive criticism, but the book of Enoch uh, is an apocryphal book but it was also found stored and stashed away in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which shows that it's not a Gnostic publication like people think that was written after the time of Christ, but that it was written before the time of Christ. And Jesus quoted the book of Enoch 22 times in his ministry. And here it says in Jude, in chapter 1, obviously, verse 14, this says, and this is talking about God's wrath that's coming on the earth. And it says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, which is interesting, isn't it? The seventh from Adam. And the number seven is covenant perfection. Enoch prophesied. Well, it's not, it's not written where he prophesied it in the canon of the scripture, but it is written in the book of Enoch. And this is the, is the best I can, re, I can recall, and I'm pretty sure this is right. This is the first recorded prophecy of any man in the Bible. I mean, Adam didn't prophesy of anything that was coming to pass, neither did Seth and, you know, Methuselah, whatever, all the, but this is recorded that a man prophesied. Uh, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. This is recorded in Enoch chapter 1, I believe, verse 8. But anyhow, uh, it says to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed of all their hard speech, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And it goes on to talk about people that will be judged. But I think it's very, very interesting see, that this prophecy is about the Lord coming back to the earth with ten thousands of his saints. This is what Revelation chapter 19 verse 12, I think, is talking about. That where the Lord comes out of heaven with the armies. And then on into verse 14, with the armies that follow out of heaven on white horses with him clothed in fine linen, bright and clean. And this was prophesied all the way back to Enoch. And it's, it's important. I mean, this is the Bible here. This is not the book of Enoch nor apocryphal books. This is the Bible that said that Enoch prophesied. The first recorded prophecy of a man was about the establishing of the millennial kingdom. Yes. You hear that? I said the first prophecy by a man the Holy Spirit working through them, the first prophecy that was ever written down and recorded in the canon of the Word of God was the prophecy of the coming of the Millennial Kingdom. Amen? So I just think that's pretty valid documentation, don't you? The first has to mean something. Anyway, so I figured you'd want to see that. The other thing that was mentioned to me, Kevin, who's videoing this, and God bless you, Kevin. We love you, man. Thank you for your hard work and what you'll be doing in editing to make these videos make me look even good. If Cecil Peebles can make me look good when I'm dead, you ought to be able to make me look good when I'm alive on the video. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Kevin came to me and asked me, he said, coming from a Roman Catholic background, the outer darkness sounds similar to purgatory. And that is a great concept, and that's in my book that I wrote. I cover it, but uh, he brought this point up, and I wanted to cover this with you. The outer darkness does not exist now. 
because it will not exist until the other side of the judgment seat of Christ. And the resurrections have not happened. What happens when people die now? Even believers, that they, when they die now, they go to paradise. And they stay there until the marriage supper of the Lamb, and they, or, I'm, excuse me, the judgment seat of Christ, where they are determined whether they will go to the marriage supper of the Lamb or not. But if, for example, you and your doctrine would put the judgment seat of Christ as soon as someone dies, then, they would, then they, there would potentially be a place like the outer darkness or what the Roman Catholics in, in the Dark Ages and Middle Ages believed was purgatory. Now, know this, that the Roman Catholic Church used purgatory as a false incentive to gain penances from people to pray their relatives out of purgatory. That's completely scripturally erroneous. But if, on the other hand, if you put the judgment seat of Christ as soon as someone died, <clears throat> I can see how there could have been a precedent whereby they could have springboarded off of their erroneous conclusion. Okay? And so I figure that was worth mentioning also. But uh, according to Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, which we, I, I told you I believe that is the judgment seat of Christ, <coughs> the judgment seat of Christ will not happen until after the resurrection of the just, when those individuals perish, during um, the great tribulation, not taking the mark of the beast, when I saw thrones and those that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and judgment given unto them, that's whenever the judgment seat of Christ takes place. So, good question. And I'm sure there's other ones. And I'm really excited about the release of this book. And you can stay in touch with me through the ministry at www.lmci.org and find out about the release of the book. But I, I believe it's destined to be a real kingdom shaker. <laughs> Amen. So let's begin now talking about repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I've, I've endeavored to be transparent with you through this class and tell you where we're going. Let me tell you where I'm going with this. I'm looking now for a rededication and a commitment from you to live according to what you've learned. So where I'm going to take this session is in teaching you the Word of God. I want to show you that the exhortation of Jesus and John the Baptist was to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I want to show you why you need to do it and how you need to do it. And then to close out our session together with taking communion and renewing our rights to the millennial kingdom. Amen? So I'm, and so my point in this is to lead you to a point of decision of repenting. Coming apart from the accursed thing or the thing that has kept you out of following the will of God. As I tell you people, even in the, the parable of the ten virgins, you know not what day or hour that the Lord is coming. Praise God. And being in a repentant state, even if you've lived in sin, and we all have, there's a point in time, a place in time when you make the turn. That's called repentance. Repentance means to turn and change. And you can do that tonight. That's what I want to help you do and to seal this with the covenant of communion as we'll partake in communion together in the Lord's Supper tonight. So I want to begin here in Matthew chapter 3. So this is a quote from guess who? In, the days, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now listen closely to me. Let me tell you something. When it says the kingdom of heaven is the reign of the king from heaven. In other words, John the Baptist is saying, The king is coming. The king is coming. You better get ready because the king is coming. Amen? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This means to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven, the needed action is repentance. That means change and follow him. Jesus did come. People did repent. See, they were baptized of John in the river Jordan. The baptism of John is a baptism of repentance. Maybe what we should do tonight, rather than take communion, would be to do water baptism. People say, well, you can only do water baptism once. Chapter, verse. 
Sounds spiritual, but it's not quite scriptural. Anyhow, John the Baptist took people down in the water and he said, repent and confess your sins. When you do water baptisms with Dale, it's a little bit different. Amen? Well, I don't do water baptisms for people to get saved. That's baptized in the name of Jesus. When you do water baptisms with Dale, and we do them, don't we, Taylor, at Teen Week. When the kids walk down and, and, and they get in the water at Teen Week, they confess their sins. Well, I did this and this with such and such and this with the other and that and this, and I'm just tired of it, and I'm ready to change because water baptism is a baptism of repentance. And that'll cut across most church doctrine right there. Most people think that you need to hurry up and get water baptized as soon as you're saved, and I think that might be a good idea. But John preached repentance, and water baptism is a baptism of repentance. And the type of this we looked at already was the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and going through the sea. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about this profile that they were baptized in Moses and in the sea. So the profile of being baptized in Moses is the same as being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for sonship, but being baptized in the sea is repentance when you go through and it washes all your sludge away. <laughs> I got a good friend of mine, one of my teachers that I've licensed, his name is Howard Lawrence, and Howard is a magnificent teacher and lives in Michigan. Howard came to my house and said, Dale, I want to get water baptized. So I said, okay, Howard. And so I took him down to the creek next to my house, and there's a creek that just runs right, AJ's been there, the creek just runs right across the road, you've got to drive through the creek. And So I took him down and waded him out in the middle of the creek, and it was October. That's when I made the hard, fast rule in my life, no water baptisms after Labor Day. <laughs> because I'm telling you, when Howard went under the water, Oh, my goodness. I thought he, he would, you know, the, the shock hit him. And I told him, I said, Howard, I thought you were going to die. And I said, but then when I realized all the sludge that came off of you when it washed down the creek, it killed three cows and a bull down the creek. Oh. <laughs> Howard will hear these tapes and listen to the video, and he'll, he'll get me back. But anyway, water baptism is a baptism into repentance. And if you've got things that's been going on in your life, you may want to consider going to your pastor or your church leader and say, you know what, I've had things that's going on in my life. I'm ready to change. I want to strive for the masteries. I want to press toward the mark of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm ready to change. And I'll tell you, when you get water baptized, the angels of God write it in your account ledger. They'll go, Big Rob got water baptized and killed all the cows in the creek today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And I, I'm having fun, but I'm not making light of it. And this is what John preached. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. After they killed John the Baptist, guess what Jesus did? He said in, in Matthew chapter 4, from that time, after John was put in prison, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was preaching the same message. It's interesting, John was the prophet who announced the coming of the apostle. Once the apostle came, the new light got shed abroad and people understood, but the prophet announces the apostles. Interesting, might not cost you anything extra, but it's still true. But Jesus preached the same thing, repent. In other words... What he said, this is what I'm saying. I want you to change tonight, right now. I don't want this teaching to be mental gymnastics and jump through hoops and to be an exercise in rhetoric and knowledge. I want this to be a life-changing experience for you and for you to change. And the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit of what you need to change in doing. Now, maybe you're saying... There's nothing I need to change. Well, praise God, and I hope you're living that close to the Lord. But if there is something in your life that you feel like that whenever you stand before the Lord that it will come up, you need to put it down. You need to let it go, and this is what repent means, and that is to turn and change and walk a different way. Jesus demands it if you want to be in his kingdom. And you know what? It may not be repent just today, it's going to be repent that repentant lifestyle for the rest of your life. In other words, you see, for a believer, Jesus is Savior. But for a disciple, Jesus is Lord. 
He means it. It's really, really true. When you confess Him as Lord, He wants you to live it. And see, we love Him, and we want to follow Him. And the fact of the matter is, He's just smarter than us. The greatest lie that's ever been palmed off in the world was when Satan said to Eve, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And you do not. I do not. You are not smart enough to judge between good and evil. And if that insults your intelligence, you're carnally minded. You think you know the difference between good and evil. No, you do not. You need God to tell you. Now, he's told us in his written word, but we have the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night to teach us what we need to do to stay in his good graces and in alignment with his kingdom. Praise God. Now, in John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's expedient, necessary, for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him to you, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of what? Sin. And of what? Right. Righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. It's interesting of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Let me ask you a question. When will the prince of this world receive the first punitive action from God? When will he be punished? The thousand year reign, he'll be chained. And this is what the Holy Spirit is witnessing to you too. While he's chained and when he's been judged, you're supposed to be free and that's what the Holy Spirit was sent to teach you about. Why? Because I go to my Father. And what? Then he's coming back. Hallelujah. And of sin to get you into that kingdom. This is the purpose and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to go get Jesus a bride. To go get him a bride. So repent. He reproves you of sin. He reproves you of righteousness because Jesus goes to the Father. You are righteous. You are supposed to be righteous to live in that kingdom. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. He will be chained in the thousand year reign while the Holy Spirit has prepared you to be in it. And you believe that's right there in John chapter 16. And it's all about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to prep you for the millennial kingdom. I have read John 14, 15, and 16 so many times, but when this has jumped off the page at me, it's all the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to prep you for the millennial kingdom. To live holy now. This is His kingdom. To give you righteousness, peace, and joy in life now, but to prepare you for the coming kingdom. <coughs> repent. What does repent mean? Very simply, it means do what the Holy Spirit says. And the Holy Spirit will tell you to do what the Bible says, and then he'll give you the specifics what the Bible doesn't cover. In other words, the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not rent X-rated videos. But the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit will tell you the specifics of what you need to do. You know, brother, I'm just thinking in my life, I'm looking back at, at Pastor David and thinking about the, the qualifications to lead people. And one time in my life, and I don't mean to bring up sin, but just to, to bring up the deceit of the devil and not to magnify him, but to show you just how slick and tricky he is. One time in my life, I knew a very great man, one of my teachers, and the devil so deceived him that he considered it an okay practice for him to, have a, to commit adultery. And he just sexually abused and and had adultery with just so many women. And he took that sin with him to the grave. And it's all the lie of I'm the exception. That's it. It all goes back to that. And of course, iniquity of lust and other things of this nature. And 
God have mercy on him, I'm, and, and may God count what he's done for me. And, and the Bible does say if you help a man escape his sins, then you'll hide a multitude of your own. And, but anyway, that's God's business to judge him. But the point I'm after here is, God's no respecter of persons, and he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong that he's done. And I told you, I've been transparent, that I want this particular session to be a point of decision for you of repentance and of change, and a time for the Holy Spirit to search your heart, to reprove you of righteousness, of, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Amen? See, I tell you what, it says in the Bible that I was young and now I'm old. <laughs> Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. I've been young and now I'm older. And I know what it's like to go through periods of youthful lust. I say this to you, handsome teenage boys and beautiful young women that are here. I know what it's like to go through periods of stupidville. I know what it's like to lust after things of the flesh. But you know what? God wants you to depart from the unclean thing. Come apart from the accursed thing. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The Word of God exhorts us. So that's what God wants you to do, to repent. Now, in addition to repenting for what you have done wrong, there's another stipulation I've been saving to teach to you, and that's out of Matthew chapter 25, and that is to not get you to do, to not just to get you to quit doing what's wrong, but to get you to doing what's right. Now, remember the the time when I finally made up my mind and busted all my beer bottles and declared war against the demon of alcoholism and cursed him and spit on him and got an advantage over him through the blood of Jesus. And I'm free. Hallelujah. But I'll never, and after I'd been free and I'd quit drinking for a couple of months, I was praying one day and the Lord said to me, well, now that I got you to quit doing what you're not supposed to be doing, now I can work with you to do what you're supposed to be doing. It's an interesting thing in life that, and I'll tell you, it's not that God forsakes you, but you forsake God. And you can't hear Him when you're in sin. Once you confess of that sin and repent of it and start walking in the right ways, you'll find out God never moved. It's just that you came back home like the prodigal son. I came back home and he really started directing me in my life. But whenever that happened to me in my life, there was an anointing that came over me to cast out demons that I'm still going strong in. I hate those creeps. I hate the devil for what he did to me those years of my life and, to, and, and stole from me in those years. Guess what? It's payback time. And the boys are back in town. Praise God. Amen? But there's, a, there's an act. So here's the two actions. You need to stop doing what has kept you from walking in righteousness, and you need to start doing what you need to do to prepare for this kingdom. And to teach this to you, I want to show you from Matthew chapter 25, this parable that has the mention of the outer darkness in it, but the truths in it that are just magnificent for us to understand. Notice this, for the kingdom of heaven. See this parable? This is dealing with the millennial kingdom. This is the cloaked truth to those who do not have eyes to see, and that's not you. You have eyes to see. The millennial kingdom, that's what this says, the millennial kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. This is a man traveling to a far country who called his own service and delivered to them his goods. And the one he gave five talents to another two and to another one, watch this closely, to every man according to his several ability. Straightway he took his journey. And he gave to every one according to their ability. You know, if God gave you a lot of talents, it's because you've got the ability to develop them. And whom much is given, much is required. I think about this when individuals say, Boy, Dale, you're really going to be rewarded in heaven or in the kingdom of heaven. Well, I hope so. I hope it's a big payday. But, you know, God doesn't view people the way people view people. God views people the way he does, Jesus said, about the widow's might. It's not what you have. It's what you do with what you have. And God gave to these, in this parable, the ability, the, the talents were given to people according to their several abilities. So he gave five to one, he gave two to another, 
and he gave one to another one, and then he left. And see, this is exactly what we're dealing with with Jesus in his, in his absence now. He took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Likewise, he that had received the two, he also gained another, uh, gained other two. It's interesting. I, I just throw this out here since I deal with people that is of biblical acumen here. If you'll study the word traded and made and the word gained, there's a great revelation in those three words because it shows the level of aggressive trading. Amen? The guy that had five really went after it. And the guy that had two, well, he sort of went after it, but not the way the guy that had five did. Anyway, just those, they're different words. They mean different things. But anyhow, verse 18, And he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So you got the picture? Five made ten, two made four, one hid it. Verse 19, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth. <laughs> Reckoneth with them. So he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained them. I have gained beside them five talents more. Verse 21, the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of of thy Lord. Now when we read this in Luke chapter 19, it says, enter into the kingdom that he's prepared for you since the foundations of the world. So that is the joy of entering into that kingdom. Amen? But it says, it's interesting, it says, well done, good and faithful servant. I think about this whenever we talk about being un in, uh, under, the, under pressure and in heat. It's like being in a pressure cooker and then the Lord checks and opens the top of the pressure cooker and says, well done. <laughs> You're thoroughly cooked. You're finished. You're not raw or rare anymore. Well done. Hallelujah. <laughs> well done, good and faithful servants. And see, enter. See, enter. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Verse 22. He also that had received... Two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest me the two talents. I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Identical thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And it's no accident that Jesus said the same thing in verse 21 as he did in verse 23. Because it's really not important in regard to his judgment of what talents you have. It's what you did with what you have. I remember the, the, the first book I wrote. And I, the first book that I wrote, ever wrote, I did, You Don't Have to Be Smart to Walk with God, and I took the first copy home and I gave it to my mother. It was sort of interesting. I realize now why it is because my mom said to me one time when I was in high school, she said, you know, Dale, not everybody can go to college. You might need to think about, you know, getting, going to a technical school. And the reason being is my grades weren't that great. I mean, I, I got into college because... You know, the guidance counselor liked me and, and, and gave me a good recommendation. It's been still a story of my life. But anyway, when I, when I wrote my first book, I took it home and I gave it to my mother. And she goes, I didn't know you could write. And it was, but it's true. I was sort of, I was sort of a slacker until I got my bearing on my compass straight. And once I got my bearing on my compass straight, I've done pretty well and stayed focused. And I've. But it's, it's, see, it's not what you've got. It's what you do with what you've got. 